All right, over there, Mark chapter 7, we have an interesting story here we're jumping into. Let's go ahead and look at verse number 1, kind of skim through this story real quickly, leading up to our text. Verse 1 says, Then came together unto him the Pharisees, and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with the file, that is to say, to say unwashed hands, they found fault for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. So here we have Jesus has at a, is invited to a dinner, and the Pharisees, they, they are constantly trying to, to catch him. They're constantly trying to find fault in him, and they're sort of just setting him up constantly. And one thing that they find fault in is when his disciples are eating, they don't wash their hands first. Now, Obviously, this is nothing. This does not mean that it's not a good practice to wash your hands, and that's not the point of the story. The point is that, and this is what Jesus is addressing, is that's not in the Bible. And what the Pharisees would do is they would take traditions. They would take things that maybe they, uh, it's a, you should wash your hands before you eat, but they would take certain things and they would preach their words as if they were the Word of God. And that's why Jesus calls it tradition here. And here Jesus, skip down to verse 6, We'll look at verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, saying, Why walk not thy disciples according to the Bible? Is that what they say? No. They say according to the tradition of the elders. That's, that's what they cared about. They had thought of themselves so highly that their traditions were esteemed as the Bible. He answered and said unto them, and here Jesus addresses in verse 6 sort of a recurring problem that God has always had with his people um, th <laughs> throughout the years. Uh, he says in verse well hath Isaiah, this is speaking of Isaiah, prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written. Notice what he says here. This people, this is a problem that he's quoting Isaiah, so God has had this problem with them before. He says, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Here Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he's quoting Isaiah 29, 13. You don't have to turn there, but it says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. So God is essentially saying here, they are, he's frustrated. He's saying, you know, they do lip service to me and they, they, claim, they claim to, to love me and they claim to do my commandments but their heart is not really there. This is similar to where uh, Jesus said, oh, the Pharisees, you know, you do all these things, you, you tithe, you do all these things, which we're not wrong to do. He says, these ought you have to do, but the problem is that they were leaving the weightier matters of the law undone, judgment, mercy, and faith. So the problem was not that the Pharisees were washing their hands. The problem is not of the things they did. The problem is not that they tithed. Many of these other things are commandments in the Bible, but the problem is that they did these things while admitting the weightier matters of the law, the things that meant more to God. And as in so doing, this indicated that their heart was not actually towards God. They were more concerned about themselves. Concerned um, In John, it would talk about how they were more after the praise of men than, than being in favor with God. So turn to Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. So what I'd like to look at this evening is because we see this theme. We're going to look at in Haggai chapter 1, this theme of, just because is every Christian, every saved believer would do lip service to God. Every saved believer, would, regardless of how backslidden they are or how spiritual they are, would say, oh, I, I love God. And I, they, they would do lip service to the Bible and they would, they would, with their mouth, they would show forth honor to God. But I'm going to point out this morning as, as sort of an introduction is that has nothing to do with where your heart lies. Now, what I'd like to do, you're there in Haggai chapter... One, look at verse 2. Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. The context is that the, the Israelites have just come out of captivity. They have been judged in Babylon for 70 years. Now they are coming out of captivity. And God wanted them to, God instructed them. He had both Haggai and Zechariah at this time preaching to them that he wanted them to build the, rebuild the house of God. He wanted them to rebuild the temple. Verse 2 says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts. So God's frustrated with them here. He's, he's just brought them back out of this captivity. He says, This people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And then came with the word of the Lord, Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, 
O ye to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lieth waste. So God is talking about this problem where these people have come back from captivity, and they're building houses for themselves, they're getting settled in, but the house of God is still rubble, it's still in ruins. And God is frustrated with them, and notice verse 5, the, the verse of the, the week, if you look at your bulletin, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He's saying, you know, maybe you should just stop for a second and slow down and kind of look at your life and look at your actions and think, and just consider your ways. Think, is this what God wants? Is this, is, is my heart in the right place? Verse 6, he, he kind of describes a problem that they're having. He says, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat and have not enough. So their life sort of, they're not really cursed. I mean, they're not in Babylon anymore, but they're not really being blessed either. They're sort of just, their life's just kind of, they're just kind of going through the motions. They're, they're not, they're, they're specifically, they are not being blessed. Ye have, ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. So he's saying, you know, you're just not really, you're not doing great. You know, you, 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 you're, you're doing everything. You're, you're eating, but you never really quite have enough food. You're, you, you plant, but you're not really harvesting quite what you expected. They're not being blessed. So God says again in verse 7. He says a second time. He says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Verse 8, Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. So this morning, what I'd like to do is I'd like us all to do a spiritual self-diagnosis. I'd like us all to stop and consider our ways. And because every one of us this evening, or this morning, sorry, would do lip service to God. And we'd, we'd, we'd claim to, to serve God and love God. But let's slow down and let's, let's all self-diagnose ourselves and look at the measuring sticks of, of, that the Bible mentions on, and try to find out where our heart lies. Is our heart in spiritual things? Is it in unspiritual things? Is it with the world? Is it with, is it with God? Where are we all at this morning? Let's self-diagnose ourselves. Because Proverbs 21.2, you don't have to turn there, says that, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. So everyone to themselves, this is just mankind in general, whether someone's saved or not saved, everyone thinks that the way they are and the way they are doing things is right. So instead of comparing to what we think, let's compare ourselves to the Bible this morning. Turn to Matthew 6. Matthew 6. I apologize, that was a typo. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. So let's look at a few things this morning. How, how do we tell where we are spiritually? Where is our heart? If it has nothing to do with what we say necessarily, or that's not strong enough of an indicator, if it's possible to say one thing but our heart be somewhere else, how do we tell? The well, first way this morning is this. What do you spend your time on? What do you spend your time on? You're there in 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 17. The Bible says this, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, notice this, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Saying if you're saved, if you call, if you called on the Father and you are saved, it's saying, here's what you should do, you should pass the time of your sojourning. Because we're not our home is not this earth. We are we are just passing through, the Bible says. So how do you, as we are passing through this this earth and with our very limited time, how are you passing that time? Are you passing that time in fear? Were you passing that time in other things? How do you use your time on earth fearing God? T turn to James chapter 4. And the reason that this is such a good measuring stick or such a good comparison or good way to tell how, how, where you are spiritually is because you only have so much of it. Time is actually very similar to money in that sense. You've heard the, the, the saying, you know, put your money uh, where your mouth is. And the same way, the reason that money can be used in some manners to, to tell what you really care about is because it's a finite resource. So if you have something that's finite, what you, what you decide to spend that on, time is no different. What you choose to spend that limited time on shows what you really care about in, the, in this world. Benjamin Franklin once said, you may delay, but time will not. It's a finite resource. You know, the time will not stop. In James chapter 4.13, I want to look at a, this verse is often used to talk about how your life is a vapor and time is, is, is a finite resource. And that's, that's what it's saying. That's a very great 
Um, but there, there's a greater meaning of this chapter, there's a, of these few verses. There's a, there's a greater um, lesson that the Bible's trying to teach us here. Verse 13 says this, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be in the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. So here he's, not, he's just talking about people making business plans. This is something we all do every day. This is something we, just making plans in life that have to do just with life in general and decisions we all make in life. And here he's talking about people who have a plan of, okay, we're going to go into a city and we're going to start a business. We're going to sell, we're going to buy, uh, we're going to try to uh, make some money. Nothing wrong with that. But look at verse 15. He doesn't say that's wrong to do. He doesn't say you shouldn't do that or think that. But here's what he does say. He says, for, here, here's how I can correct that a little bit. Here's how you could say this a little better. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So the lesson here is that, obviously, it's a major factor that, yes, life is a finite resource, but the major lesson here is that everything you do at that time needs to be run through the will of God. It, there's nothing wrong with making plans. There's nothing wrong, but everything you do, you, should, you ought to say, okay, if God will, if this is what God wants, we shall do this or that. Turn to Psalm 90. Everything we do as Christians should filter through the will of God. God's not against you having success or, or you having money, but there's a point where if you don't run that through the will of God, that can those things or any earthly thing can take preeminence over what God wants. Psalm chapter 90. Psalm 90 is a is a great chapter. This is actually Psalm 90 was written by Moses. In the beginning you'll see it was written by Moses, the man of God. So Psalm 90 was actually written by the prophet Moses, and it's just a great chapter where he's uh, essentially the whole psalm, he's speaking about time. He's talking about time, and he's sort of pondering on time, and thinking about time, and how it affects us as believers. It a, he says this, he's talking to God here, this is a prayer, it says, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, and our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. So he's just sort of lamenting in a sense, or the fact that we only have a finite uh, amount of time to serve God, and we're sinners, and we make mistakes, and no one is perfect. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. Notice this, we spend our years all that is told. Your life, the way we spend our time, it's like a story. It's like a, uh, this is what a biography is. You read, you're, what are you reading? You're reading about, how, about someone's time on earth. You're reading about someone's life. Which is, a, as a side note, this is a I've, I've heard that it put this way, your life is a tale that is told, so how is your story going to be told? You are writing your story every day that you live, every, every decision you make, you are pinning down a story that cannot be erased. How will that tale be told? What are you writing down with your life? Is you, what are you spending your time doing? Are you spending your time serving God? Are you spending your time... Is, is today story? Is, is this next week's story of your life going to be a story of serving God throughout the day or thinking about following God's commandments throughout the day and, and every waking hour? Or is it going to be a story of fulfilling the lust of the flesh? Is it going to be a story of, of doing what God wants and doing what God is against? Look at verse number 8. That was said our, I'm sorry, we already read that. Verse 10. The days of our years are three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years. So he's just talking about how we only live for a certain amount of time, yet their strength is labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. This is the, the hymn we sing, um, you know, all, all fly away. That's what it's talking about. We have a short amount of time, and we die, and we, we go to heaven. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. And verse 12, he says this, So, because of this, because we have a short amount of time, because uh, we're, we're writing our story down every single day, so, he, he says to God, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts into wisdom. So he's saying, as a result of this God, as a result of the time that you've only given us, a certain amount of time, we don't know when it is, it's soon, it's nothing compared to eternity. As a result of that, that God, help us to take our days, our, our years, our numbers, and apply them under wisdom. Be wise with them as much as we possibly can. 
This is the song in, our, in the hymnal, So Little Time. It was written by John R. Rice, an independent fundamental Baptist preacher. Um, and the words say this on one of the verses. So little time, the harvest will be over. All reaping done, we reapers taken home. Report our work to Jesus, Lord of harvest, and hope he'll smile, and that he'll say, well done. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us lost souls to win. Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner in. A song speaking about not just we should go out soul winning and we should preach the gospel, but the fact that our, the, the amount of time that we spend doing it is directly proportional to how much success we will have at it. If we, do not, if we spend half the time or we spend twice the amount of time that uh, soul winning and preaching the gospel, this just being one area that we would have, there will be twice as many people in heaven than, than there would have been as a result of our actions. So, we want, to just, we want to find out, we want to do a self-diagnosis of where is our heart spiritually, or is our heart in the right uh, area? Well, the first way we can decide that this morning is, what do we spend our time doing? Look, even if you are three to five, and you should be three to five, but even if you are, you're only in this church for about six hours a week. What are you doing with the rest? What are you doing? And just like Jim said, that doesn't mean that every single waking hour has, is, is meant to be at church, but everything we do when we're not at church, everything that we do when we're not so winning, everything that we do when we're not reading our Bible, when we're not praying, everything, all those things still should be at least run through the will of God and make sure that God has the preeminent spend our time. Turn to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter chapter number 4. So we're discussing how to tell where our heart is spiritually. The first way is, well, what, do we, what do you spend your time doing? The second way is this, what do you get happiness from? What do you get happiness from? What makes you joyful in life? There in 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse 12. Beloved, think not, think not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. So he's talking to believers who are being persecuted, and he's saying, don't think it's some strange thing. Don't think it's some unusual thing that this is happening to you. But verse 13, rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. And you read this and you say, rejoice, glad, happy. How, how is this? How is this supposed to give me joy in life? How is this supposed to give me happiness in life? Because when your heart is in the right place, when your heart is with the Bible and with serving God, there are certain things that, you, that are going to give you joy that you would not get joy from if your heart was away from God. Let's look at a few different areas of this. The first one is persecution. That's what this verse is referring to. Persecution. Persecution should make you glad. It, I, I love that verse in the book of Acts where it mentions when they were beaten for the cause of Christ in, in the, towards the beginning of the book. It says they, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. They weren't. Instead, they could have been angry and they could have been mad and, and they, could have, uh, they could have been embarrassed or they could have been resentful, but instead the emotion that they had was they were happy just that they were worthy, just that God had given them the privilege to suffer for His name. Those are people whose heart is in the right spot. That's an indication of that. Here's another thing that should give you happiness in life. Getting people saved. Leading people to Christ. That should give you joy. That, that, should, that, that should come close to being, if not the most happiest thing in your life. Turn to 3 John 3. 3 John 3. While you're turning there, I'm going to read you Psalm 126, 5-7 through that says this, They that sow in tears shall weep in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, that is the word of God. He that goeth forth and weepeth, that has compassion, just like Jesus had compassion, just like Jesus wept for the multitude, bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Here is someone, in, written in a poetic way, who goes, he, he, he goes forth bearing the 
according to the word of God. He, he, his heart is in it. He goes forth. He's weeping. And he comes again, bringing his sheaves with him. Just like the fruit that we bear in this earth, the people we get saved on this earth, Jesus is often compared to sheaves as a harvest. It says they will come back with rejoicing. They'll come back with those sheaves and those souls that they have won to Christ with great rejoicing. But not just getting people saved. What about discipling others? Because getting saved has nothing to do with your work. Someone can get saved and never come to church again in their life, and they'll probably spend the rest of their life being chastised by God on this earth, and they'll never, uh, they'll never be truly blessed on this earth. But that can happen. So when we get people saved, that's not where it ends. Many, someone who preaches a false gospel, someone who preaches you have to repent of your sins to be saved, or you have to, you're being saved over a period of years, or, or your work save you, what he teaches is that salvation is the end of the road. Salvation is what you're shooting for. Your whole life is, is trying to get saved, trying to hope you can be saved, trying to be saved over a period of time. The Bible, what the Bible, what the, what the, what the gospel says, is that salvation is just the beginning. Salvation is the beginning. Someone comes to you, that's easy. That's the easy part. Someone comes to you and just tells you about Christ. You believe, you believe on Jesus Christ. You get saved. You have eternal life. Now your Christian life has just begun. This is the starting line. You have, the whole, you have your whole life ahead of you. You have the whole Christian life ahead of you. You, are about, you. you have just started, much less finished. Here, 3 John, look at 3 John uh, verse 3. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came. He's talking to people he has gotten saved. When the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in truth. Verse 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, talking spiritually here, walk in truth. This is similar to how Paul would refer to people he's gotten saved as, as, his, as his son in, in the faith. Or uh, This is what he's saying here. He's saying, there's no greater joy in my life. There's no greater happiness I've experienced than not just leading someone to Christ and seeing someone's soul go right there in front of me, go from death unto life, but actually seeing that soul, that person, grow in Jesus Christ and learn to, and start coming to church themselves and get baptized and walk spiritually and learn to soul in and learn to get other people saved. There's no greater joy I have than that, he says. This is what should give you joy in life. Turn to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. Here's another one. What about helping others, just in general? Just helping other people and putting other people before yourselves. Proverbs 29, but Proverbs 14.21 says this, He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. So how, how am I happy? If I'm helping other people, I'm losing resources. I'm losing money. I'm losing time. I, I'm losing uh, whatever it is. I, I'm, it's a net loss. How, how, how does that make me happy? Well, if your heart is in the right place, that, that will give you joy. That will give you happiness. And there in Proverbs 29, here's another one that should give you joy. Following the laws of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. You keep the law and you're serving God and your heart is in the right place, that will give you joy. That will give you happiness. And you say, well, it doesn't give me joy. These things don't give me joy. I don't have joy from, uh, uh, from serving God. I, I, I just do it because I have to, right? Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't give me joy to help others. It doesn't give me joy go soul winning then consider your ways consider your ways obviously no one's ever going to be perfect so it's something that literally applies to everybody our, our heart is never going to be in a perfect place with God that will never happen until unless we are sinless so we can take all these things if they look at this one area of the Christian life that is no longer giving you joy or giving you happiness work on getting your heart back in the right place Turn to Proverbs 16 Here, here's another area that should give you happiness. Trusting in God. Trusting in God. Taking trust off yourself just in your day-to-day -day life and putting more of it on God. Psalm 146, 5, you're turning to uh, Proverbs 16, says this, Happy is the man that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Salvation is just a small example of that. It's, a, it's, that, that's why, uh, it, it's such a joy to be saved. Because knowing that you are trusting God and knowing that God has your salvation taken care of, that's why that's, that should be so exciting and give you so much happiness and joy in life. But it's not just with salvation, it's with every other area of your life. 
you're in a point in your life where you're trusting God and in in multiple areas of your life and and you're leaving you you you're le- you have you have strong faith that will give you happiness. You're there in Proverbs 16. Look at verse 20. It says, "He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth in the Lord, happy is he." Turn to Ecclesiastes 2. We'll end this point with Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Let's look at a bad example of this. So we looked at all these good examples of, hey, this should give you happiness, this should give you happiness, this should give you joy. But let's look at the wrong example of this. Let's look at when, what happens when, when the opposite is done. When someone goes to the world for happiness or goes to, it goes to uh, that, that depends solely on what the world has to offer for their happiness. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, look at verse 1. This is Solomon. This is Solomon sort of lamenting on the mistakes he made in life. That's what Ecclesiastes is. Verse 1, I said in mine heart, Go to now, while I prove thee with worth. Therefore enjoy pleasure. Look, again, there's nothing wrong with having money, and there's nothing wrong with having success and getting happiness from that. But when it comes to the core of what gives you purpose and joy in life, it should not be what the world has to offer. I said of laughter it is mad and of mirth what doeth it so now we're going to go just down the list looking at all the things that's what he's talking about here that he tried for happiness the specific things that he went to for happiness I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine he tried alcohol a lot of people are trying that yet acquainting my heart with wisdom look at verse 4 I made me great works so he built things I build me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water it wherewith the wood there bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. Notice how he keeps saying, I had more than anyone had ever had up to this point. I, I, there was no one before me that, that had what I had at this time. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. Verse 9, so I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. So, and again, the problem, if you look at this, the problem is not necessarily that it made him happy to plant trees. It made him happy to build himself a house. The problem was that gave him what, what, of all these things that you see listed, you know what you don't see? You don't see the joy he got from helping other people. You don't see the joy he got from teaching. David would talk about the joy that, that, that was given to him by telling other people about the Lord. You don't see that here. You don't see the joy he got from from discipling people and teaching people about the Word of God that he got from trusting in God. That was that's that's omitted here because that's not that had nothing that was no part of what gave him joy at this point in his life. Verse ten, he just reiterates this and talks just talks about how how this was in whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. My heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was the portion of all my labor. And then verse 11, I, I, I feel like, I, I love verse 11 because I feel like there's a certain moment you can almost see in his writing. You can almost see a certain moment in his life where something clicked with him, where, where he, there's a realization that hid him. Where he had everything and he thought he was happy and he got to a point where it finally clicked with him that he was miserable. That all these things he had, he was still had an empty life. Verse 11, then, so after he had all, all these things, then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought. He's, he's, I, 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 I believe there's a moment that it clicked with him where he realized this, where he looked at everything he had. He was looking at his vineyards. He was looking at his trees and pools of water and house and silver and gold. And on the labor that I had labored to do, again, the time, because labor is time. He's looking at the time he spent doing these things. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. It was a moment where he looked at it all and he saw all these things and, and none of it was for God. None of it was for serving the Lord. And he looks at it and he says, this is all a waste. This is all for nothing. 
all the time and labor of my life that I spent all the good I could have done, and this, this was all I did with it? This was all I did with it? Verse 17, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought unto the Son is grievous unto me. Because what you see, we're not going to read it all, but between verse 11 and verse 17, in a heavy theme throughout the book, is he talks about how so many things are vain because of the fact that we all die. We're all going to leave this earth at some point. So he's talking about all this, and the reason he saw this as vain is because he looked at this, and he's like, you know, I'm going to die anyway. What was the point of spending 100% of my efforts in life on this? Look, if you were saved in... All of your effort, the majority of your happiness in life and what, give, what, you, what you go to for happiness and what you go for, for joy, if, if the majority of it is for searching for happiness and vain things, you will come to deeply regret it one day. Guaranteed. Because, you know, we all have the Holy Spirit in us. And there's, just like with Jonah, you cannot run from the Holy Spirit. And if, if we search the wrong things to where the joys of the Bible and the joys of church and soul winning, if those things no longer give us happiness anymore, we go to happiness for other things, we will come to regret that one day. Turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter number 15. So, how do we tell where our heart is spiritually this morning? How do we tell if our, if our heart is really in the right place or if we need to make corrections or adjustments well, the first way is, what do we spend our time on? Ask, ask yourself that. What, what do I spend, what, what do I, what am I most excited to spend my time doing? And then the second thing is, what do I get happiness from? What, what do I do, what do I go to for mainly in my life that gives me excitement? What gives me happiness and what doesn't give me happiness? What, what do I, maybe even things I do that I don't, I, don't, I don't really get happiness from. How about this one, what would you give your life for? What do you give your life for? Acts chapter 15, look at verse 25. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Look what they say about them. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, even if we knew nothing about Paul and Barnabas, even if, even if they were never mentioned again in the book of Acts, even if this is the only mention in the Bible that we ever had of these two men, that's all we knew about them, just from these two verses, or rather that one, I bet I could tell you where their heart was. I bet I could tell you what their deepest care was in life. I bet I could tell you what they spent. Just, just this one glimpse of a single phrase, of a single verse, I bet I could look at that and I could, I could, uh, I could have a pretty successful prediction of what the majority of their life was spent doing. Or where their heart was. Turn to John 13. John 13. Well, you're turning to John 13 because ultimately the, good exam the best example of this is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of this. Well, how do we know, how do we know what Jesus cared about? How do we know why he came to this earth? It's because of what he died for. Well, you're turning there. I'll read you Matthew 20, verse 28, where Jesus says this, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, he's teaching his disciples about leadership and, and how... If you want to be in a leadership position, you have to serve. You, 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 it's, not, it's not this preeminent position. If you want to be a leader, you must serve other people. And he's teaching, he's saying, here's, here's the best example of this, it's me. I'm the best example of this, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. He says, I, I didn't come to this earth to be served, to be treated like a king, but rather to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He says, I came to take this life and to give it to other people, not myself. John 13, verse 1, I love this verse. It says, Now therefore, or now before the, the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, he knows that it's his time. Throughout the Gospels, he, he, you know, he would tell people, my time's not come. My time, his time was not yet come. His time was not yet come. Now it is his time to die for the sins of the world. And it says, when he knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. His greatest concern, obviously Jesus, he asked God and he prayed God to, if it was possible, to remove this death from him. 
But his greatest concern, his greatest sadness was, was leaving his disciples behind. He says he loved them unto the end. You say, how, how, do you, how do we know this? 1 John 3.16, you don't have to turn there, says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. Here's how we know he loved them unto the end. Here's how we know that's not just the narrator saying that. Because he laid down his life for us. We ought to also, ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. In John 15, Jesus would say, No greater love have the man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. We know what Jesus cared about because of what he did. That's why all these religions that say, Oh, Jesus was just a good teacher, he was just a good man. They're missing, obviously, salvation, but the greatest part of Jesus they're missing is that, they, that you can't, the Muslim can't prove to me what Jesus cared about. The, the, the person who believes Jesus was real or just walked around on this earth, but he wasn't God and he wasn't deity and he didn't die for us, they can't tell me what he cared about because they don't believe that he died for what he actually died for. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. Then Revelation chapter number 12, the Bible says this, And I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And look at verse 11. Talking about believers here. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The reason we are going to overcome, we, are, we still have the flesh in this life, but the reason that we'll one day we win in the end, or the, one, the reason that we will one day overcome the devil and sin and death is because we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, and look at this phrase that says, and they love not their lives unto the death. They didn't, they didn't love their life. They, they loved God who died for them. That, when it came down to it, when it came down to the very end, that's who they loved their life for. Someone once said this, they said, if you're not at least willing to die for something, something that really matters, in the end, you die for nothing. That's true. So another person once said, no one knows who they are alive until they know, or why they are alive until they know what they would die for. Turn to Revelation 2, you're already in Revelation, turn to Revelation chapter 2. A few things will define in a greater way where your heart is than knowing yourself what you would give it. Revelation verse 2, look at verse 9, or chapter 2, look at verse 9. I know thy works. Is Jesus talking to the churches here? He's rebuking some, he's praising some, he's both rebuking and praising some. I know thy works. So God knows our works, God knows our heart. That's, 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 that's known to God. The, the purpose of this sermon isn't because God doesn't know where our heart is, it's so we can know where our heart is so we can fix it or improve it. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not but are of the synagogue of Satan. Through none of those things which thou shalt suffer, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Here Jesus says, you know, I, I, you're going to have persecution, you're going to have tribulation, and it's not, it's not just enough that you're faithful, I need you to be faithful, I need you to be faithful unto your death, is what I need. Look, Christ was faithful. If you're saved, Christ was faithful unto death for you. Would you do the same for him? Turn to Colossians 3. So, how do we tell where our heart is? This is a, Colossians 3 is the last place we'll turn. Okay, we, where do we spend our time? What do we spend our time doing? That's a, that's, a good, that's a good measurement. What gives us happiness? What would we die for? That's a big one. But here's perhaps the greatest one. Here's the, perhaps the greatest measurements of where your heart is with God. What do you live for? What do you live for? Look, dying for Christ is often considered the epitome of spirituality, and I, I wouldn't disagree with that. But I, I've heard it said, 
Pastor Mejia had a sermon I listened to um, a, a few months ago, and it was, he made a really good point. But that's what perhaps is, is harder and more difficult than dying for Christ is spending an entire life living for him. He's like, dying for Christ, that's a decision you make in one moment. That's a big decision. And Jesus says that those who have died for him and were martyred for him, they will receive a special reward in heaven, a crown of life. But you know what's difficult? Spending an entire lifetime deciding every single moment whether or not to serve God. Colossians 3, look at verse 1. The Bible says this, If then ye be risen with Christ, that's everyone here, if you're saved, everyone who is here, that, that is we are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. You say, okay, that, that sounds nice, but how do I do that specifically? So I set, my thing, uh, set my affection on, on what God wants. It, that's easy. This is, this is the sort of thing that people give lip service to, but specifically, how do we do this? How do we know if we're doing this? Look at verse 5. Mortify, kill, therefore, your members which are on the earth. Just look, when you got saved, the, the new man, born inside of you, but you still have the old man. You still have the flesh with you. You still have the, our sinful, we still have our sinful nature with us. When we die, the old man, that is when the, the old man will finally perish. Mortify therefore your members which are on the earth. Fornication. Here, here's some specifics for you. Uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil conspicuance, covetousness, idol, which is idolatry. Covetousness in the New Testament is, is often compared to the... Because in the Old Testament, idolatry was a major thing. In the New Testament, it's often compared to uh, uh, covetousness. It's, it's the same concept. You're having something that you're putting in front of God. You're having... Uh, you, it's the same... If it was an idol, you're taking some, some thing that's not real, some temporary thing, some, some uh, mortal thing on earth, and you are placing it above God in your life. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. These are things that God chastises us for as believers. In the which he also walked some time when he lived in them. But now you have also put off all these. He's saying you used to walk in these things before you were saved. So don't keep walking in them. Anger. Wrath. Look, are you, are you an angry person? Blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Do you still speak the same way as before you got saved? Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. He's saying, you need to take this old man that's still there, you need to try to put him off. You need to try to get rid of him. He's, he, didn't, he didn't die when you got saved. He, he, you, you have eternal life, that's what the new man is, but you still have the flesh with you. Look at verse 10. And now have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. He says, you have the new man, act like it. Look at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, again, the saved, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. So write these down to remember these things. Put Bookmark this in your Bible because these are the specifics. When it comes to what do you live for, what do you spend your life doing, this, these, are, these are the specifics we can compare to. Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, Forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. There's another theme in the Bible. Don't, you know, Christ forgave you. It doesn't matter if you forgave everyone. None of us will be perfect at doing this, but if we forgave everyone in our life for anything that they ever did against us, no matter how severe, that will never come close to what Christ forgave you. Above all, these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And then I, I love verse 15, how it kind of ties it together. It says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are also called the one body, and be ye thankful. Look, if, if you can do this, if you can, if you can live a life where your heart is with God, and no one's perfect, and no one will ever be perfect and, and until, until the old man dies and we are in heaven, but if we can have a heart that is towards God, and if we can spend a life where where our time is, our, the priority of our time and our happiness, and what we would die for, what we would live for is to God, there is an unmatchable peace that comes along with that, of serving the Lord. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another 
So he's just talking about the joy that will come from if you can do this. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What do you listen to? Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In verse 17, he ties it all together. He says, whatsoever you do, whatever you do in your life, what does it mean to live for God? Whatsoever you do in word or deed, whatever you say and whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. If you are thankful, and that's why I think it ties it with thankfulness twice here, you can be thankful for your salvation, you can serve God with thankfulness, out of thankfulness for what he did for you, the peace of God will rule in your heart. Look, this, this is the spiritual, successful, selfless Christian life. Is this where your heart is? You know, I, it's, it's funny, kind of in, in closing, I was, um, I was, I was thinking about this, this, as I was writing the sermon, I was thinking about this phrase you hear a lot, where people talk about finding yourself. And, you know, it gets made fun of a lot. Oh, you know, you got to find yourself, bro. And I decided to actually look it up and see, see what this is. Just, okay, people who say this from their, from their perspective, what are they talking about? And basically finding yourself, what people uh, are talking about when they say that. I mean, you'll have entire articles written by professors and, and doctors on this, on this subject. Basically finding yourself and is this thing where you need to go and you need to Forget what everyone else has taught you. Forget what you were taught. Forget what it, it is doing. Forget any advice, anything. And just do, just think about what you believe and what you really want to do, and just do that thing. So basically, you just th- you think of every lust of the flesh or everything that you want or every false belief that you may have, and instead of going to the Bible or going to people who are wiser than you or going for advice, you just double down on whatever it is you want to do. That's wicked. That's evil. That, that's, that's, that's what Satan is trying to get everybody to do. Satan's trying to, because look, Satan already has, by default, we're sinning. By default, by default, we, we deserve hell. Just so born into this world and, born, and chooses to sin against God all by default, all by on their own. By default, Satan is one with them. So all this is, is, is that's what Satan wants you to do. He just wants you to take your default setting of sin and rebellion against God it's separation from God, and he just wants you to continue in that until the day you die and you wake up in hell. That's what Satan wants for the unsaved world. But look, so what we're, what essentially what this sermon is, what we're trying to do is we actually are trying to find ourselves, but the difference is that we find where we are, and we look at how wrong we are, and we correct it. We find, we find where we are, we compare it to the Word of God, we compare it to what God wants for our lives, and then we change to move towards that. Instead of doubling down with what our flesh wants and doubling down in, in, in what we want, we find ourselves. Look, you need to go and you need to find yourself. That's what this sermon is. I hope you find yourself. And then I hope you, once you've found yourself and you find where you are compared with what God wants, we need to change and move towards that. But most people can't change. It's very difficult. My, my dad would always say that. It's very, most people can't change. Or not that they can't change, but most people will not change. Amen. You need to. That's, that's what, God, look, if you're saved, you can change. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can change. Indeed. So look, let's find ourselves. Let's find out where our heart is. If you have this spectrum from, uh, from um, spiritual to unspiritual, your heart is somewhere, somewhere in there. Let's find it and for the better. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.